Hello and welcome to the Thinking Under Fire Forum. My name is Tanya Ha. I'm a science journalist and sustainability researcher and I'm delighted to be your host for this forum. The Thinking Under Fire Forum is the final webinar of the Bushfire CRC Research to Drive Change Initiative. Today the focus is on psychology, what people and their communities think and do in response to bushfire threat. We'll soon start with an introductory video, followed by three research presentations and discussion with a lead end user. And along the way, there'll be online polls and opportunities for questions and discussion. For those who are new to this online platform, I'll quickly introduce this space that we're in now. You'll see presenters appear on the right-hand side of the screen via webcam, and in the centre panel of the screen are the main research presentations, the slides that they'll be speaking to. Uh, but importantly, on the left-hand side of the screen, at the bottom corner, you'll see a dialog box with a speech bubble in its top left corner. This is the place where you can type in your questions and comments as the researchers present their work. Now, one thing to note is that our voices are coming via phone lines, with the vision coming via the internet. Now, this is done for optimal clarity and bandwidth, but it does mean that what you see and what you hear might not quite be in sync. Now, that's not a problem. Just bear with us as we progress through it. It's the best technology we have at this point in time. But if anyone is experiencing technical difficulties, they can contact the hotline on 1800 733 416. That's 1800 733 416, and tech support will assist. The forum is being recorded, and it will be available on the Bushfire CRC website in a few days' time, along with other forums from this series. Now, thanks to everyone who's already sent in questions for the presenters. They'll be addressed during the proceedings. It's now my great pleasure to let you know which researchers you'll be hearing from today. We're going to have Dr. Raul Ehrman from the University of Western Australia, Dr. Lise Nortebert from the University of Western Australia, Assistant Professor Alona McNeil from the University of Melbourne, and our lead end user is Damien Killerley from the Tasmanian Fire Service. We'll hear more from them shortly. But first, we have a poll question. How much do you think you know about community preparedness and response for bushfires? So click on nothing if you don't know much about it at all, a little, a fair bit, or a lot, just to give us a sense of your level of knowledge before we start off. And we'll give it a few seconds more. And we'll leave it there. So it seems that quite a few of you know a bit or a fair bit, and some know quite a lot. We'll see if that changes during today's presentations. But before we hear from our researchers, we're now going to see a video prepared by the Bushfire CRC that gives you an overview of the research that you'll be hearing about today. fire agencies um, in their community bushfire safety education, overwhelming people you know, with information about the things that they should do uh, uh, to, to be safe in a, in, a, in a bushfire. We were trying to outrun a fire that was in front of us the whole time. Running down the street, you just looked up, oh, we had enough. You can only run for so long. We weren't expecting to see today. We really weren't. Stress and anxiety interferes with your ability to concentrate. Uh, in, in my jargon, uh, it degrades your attention control uh, skills. Uh, so you get distracted. Uh, you, it's very hard to, um, to maintain a focus on, on what's really important. The issue we set out to address was whether unduly high levels of anxiety may be contributing in a subset of the population 
to the poor preparation uh, for, the, for threat and if so whether using these bias modification techniques that we've developed we could uh, m moderate the information processing biases in ways that might leave people better able to undertake preparatory action. What we found was that anxiety can be very beneficial to good preparatory behaviour and I wouldn't want to extend from that to say that anxiety is therefore beneficial in any threatening situation. I think it may be quite different when people are having to keep a cool head under very imminent uh, exposure to danger. But in terms of, of preparation, the, the, the findings we had were uh, actually quite illuminating and suggested that anxiety brings benefits as well as costs. Well, one of the things that had been noticed in some of the interviews that followed up um, fires that had taken place here in West Australia and in fact in other parts of the country too was that there, there seemed to be big differences not just between individuals and households but communities as a whole um, in the level of preparation that they'd undertaken and, and some of their responses to the fire as well the sorts of things that they'd said they'd done in the moment of crisis so we were interested to find out you know, what those differences were in, in broader terms and whether any of those community level differences might actually be influencing preparedness. I've got so much stuff here that I want to take and I can't grab and you know, I've got my boat and fish tanks and all that sort of stuff and you know, I want to get it but I can't. And although we knew that communities differed in social capital and so on, the thing that was actually predictive at a community level was previous experience with bushfire slash perceptions of risk to my community. And um, that obviously was very important because people who had high perceptions of risk were more likely to prepare. Um, it's not a surprising relationship, but it's not attributable to the individual. It's attributable, in a sense, to a story somehow that has become part of that community's view of itself, if I can put it simply. So it's identifying those communities that have low levels of risk perception and trying to engineer a, a, a higher level of anxiety, frankly, about what it is that could happen in the event of a bushfire. We should be creating an ability to distinguish situations where anxiety is appropriate from situations where anxiety is inappropriate. And the situations where anxiety is appropriate are those where something can be done about the danger that's signalled. Situations where there is a danger that we can do nothing about are situations where anxiety is inappropriate. And what we found with this research is that people who uh, are uh, functioning optimally are people who can experience both high levels of anxiety when it's appropriate while sustaining low levels of anxiety when it's inappropriate. Ten years ago, you know, it was this very dichotomised leave early or stay and defend. And I think the, the fire agencies are much more engaged with and aware of there is, actually the vast majority of people are thinking about waiting and seeing. And so they're aware of that, but they really just don't know how to engage with that as a conversation. And I think that's probably one of the big changes is they know that's there, but the agencies don't know how to engage with it. And the people who are in that space don't know how to make a decision. The uh, information that we're presenting to the community, uh, whether it be in um, uh, brochures and uh, TV commercials, uh, various strategies that we run face-to-face -face in communities, or indeed even in emergency warnings, isn't resonating with large sectors of the community. In order to make a real difference in the medium to long term, and it's not something that's going to happen overnight, there needs to be somewhat of a shift in in um, perceptions within agencies. Uh, in continuing to invest in big red trucks, for example, isn't going to make much difference to public safety. Uh, the real difference is going to be in engaging with communities to build community resilience. And that's going to require a shift in priorities and a shift in funding in agencies in order to make a real difference. for that video and for anyone who did have difficulty seeing and hearing that video do watch it at a later date at the Bushfire CRC website where it's now available to be viewed. Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce the first of our research presenters. We're going to hear from Dr Raul Ehrman from the University of Western Australia and he'll be presenting on community level influence on individual behaviours. Take it away Raul. Thank you Tanya. Um, 
I'd like to uh, start uh, actually with some data that we found from our Rollystone Kelmscott Red Hill post fire interviews. And one of the things we found when we actually looked at the preparedness of individuals in these communities following fire was that there are actually quite substantial differences between communities such as Gidjiganup and Kelmscott and Rollystone. And that's really despite those communities actually being quite um, geographically uh, quite close to each other. And really that's where some of our research questions come from. We were interested in whether or not there are indeed differences between communities in terms of preparedness, how big those differences are, and if so, what variables actually lead to seeing well and poorly prepared communities. Some of the other things we noticed in the bottom left-hand corner was that um, people who were members of bushfire uh, ready groups were actually more prepared than people who weren't. Um, similarly, we also noticed a relationship with risk such that people who believe themselves to be at a significant risk of bushfire were more likely to undertake preparatory actions. So this sort of gave us a bit of a starting point uh, from which we launched into our first West Australian large-scale community study, going to 9,000 homes 10 uh, in 10 communities across the fire-prone southwest of Western Australia. And if you look at the, uh, the graph of preparedness across the 10 communities, um, what you do, what we did find, was that there were indeed significant differences in terms of preparedness. But I guess uh, looking at the scale on the left, those differences really were not as large as we might have originally expected to find. Um, in fact, uh, the scale goes from zero to 100. I think our communities range from about 49 to 62. And if you look further at, uh, at actually our um, further analyses that we've done, really what we find is that the between community variants only accounts for about 4.5% of the total variation in bushfire preparedness. Overwhelmingly, about 95% of that variation actually occurs within communities at what we call the individual level. So if you look at individuals, they span the full range of the scale. Some individuals are terribly prepared, while others are, uh, are very, very well prepared indeed. Um, so actually, if you look at um, what causes, what leads to people who are high or low prepared within these communities, Individual level variables we find very uh, important uh, property type. So while people who were on medium or large scale rural properties all seem to be fairly similar, um, what we find is that they were all much more prepared than people on residential lots. Similarly, um, employment status was quite important. Number one on the left hand side there is uh, the unemployed, they were the, the worst prepared. It has an interesting effect with income. Um, actually we find retirees, number six, there to be by far the most prepared group. Um, and they might have a little bit of income, but crucially they have a lot of time on their hands to prepare. Furthermore, we also find that having previous experience with bushfire uh, makes people much more um, prepared than people without previous experience. And we also found the same effect as previously in Colin Scott Rollystone, that people who were involved in community preparedness activities were also significantly more prepared. If, however, we look at what accounts for those between community differences, um, we originally thought it might be things like social capital, so the strength of those networks and bonds between people. But we didn't actually find that to be a significant predictor. Also, we thought place attachment, how attached people were to the place that they lived in might be significant. But that didn't even differ between communities. Um, and lastly, we also thought it might have something to do with the um, proportion of properties inspected or, in other words, the vigilance of um, local governments or emergency, uh, fire emergency services uh, and, and enforcement. But that also wasn't significant. All we actually found was that it was commu aggregated community perceptions of risk um, and risk of bushfire affecting their town. And that largely was also related to um, the amount of surrounding bushland and forest. We then tried to validate these studies in a, um, findings in a further national community preparedness study where we looked at the preparedness levels of uh, people in South Australia, Victoria and Tasmania. And while we found no significant state level differences between the three states, the, actual, the rest of the results between communities were identical to our WA study. Again, very little difference between communities who didn't actually range that far, um, but most of the variation still lay um, between individuals within a community, in this case 97%. And it was the same variable, so residential households less prepared, retirees previously affected, those volunteering in community preparedness activities, all were much more prepared. Again, um, if we look at, um, sorry, one of the other things that we looked at at the individual level was what we call the theory of planned behaviour. Um, the theory of planned behaviour actually suggests that um, you can predict people's behaviour based on um, the amount of salient social norms around their uh, perceived behavioural control or their ability to undertake what you, uh, the, the behaviour that you're asking and as well as their attitudes towards the, the behaviour. So subjective social norms we found to be a significant predictor and what we're saying there is if you felt that you had, if there were neighbours 
who would judge you negatively for not preparing your household, you were more likely to prepare. And the same with perceived behavioural control, we found that to be very significant. So if you felt that you were pretty capable of undertaking bushfire preparedness activities, you were more likely to undertake them. Attitudes uh, towards bushfire we found to be less important. And once again, community level variables, just like the previous study, again, social capital, place attachment, risk, none of those we found to be significant about in working out the difference between communities. Um, in this case, what we found is that the proportion of a community involved in community bushfire preparedness activities was uh, the only significant predictor. So just to wrap up, um, what we found is that we did find differences between uh, communities in terms of bushfire preparedness, although those differences are quite small and actually smaller than we expected. Um, what we find principally is that community preparedness differs primarily as a result of a particular collection of individuals within a community. So whether or not you have a lot of retirees or a lot of people who actually are uh, active in, in bushfire preparedness or not. Um, and I guess lastly I'll just touch on social norms and personal capabilities influence preparedness. And I think this is a very important finding from our study because it's something that um, fire emergency service agencies can integrate quite quite easily in, or can think about integrating into, uh, into messages about bushfire preparedness. And um, I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Raoul. Actually, one thing that I think Ruth has sent through a question, and I think it's good to define this, is what is the definition of preparedness? Yeah, it's a, it's a very complex uh, thing. I mean, there is no one definition of preparedness. I think we've developed a scale, um, and actually uh, Illy, who is another speaker here, has also been in part of, uh, part of this development. And uh, it really it, it uses, uh, it's a development of questions that cover a range of different types of what we might call preparedness. So some of those will be about vegetation management about the property. Others will be about um, preparing in terms of uh, your house and its structure and closing things like eaves and whatnot. Others will be about um, actually planning for the evacuation. And so our measure actually integrates all of these things into a combined preparedness measure. And we've then created a short form of that which has been used in our survey. Uh, so it's actually a 27 item um, response scale. Um, it, it's not going to be perfect. There is no such thing as a perfect preparedness measure. Uh, but certainly it's had, uh, we've, we've had quite a lot of success with that scale. We have had um, a question sent in before the webinar from Steve. He asks, is there any research about the value of planning as a community or neighbourhood on the outcomes for households? If yes, should we put more energy into community-based planning? Yeah, I, I, think, I think that's a really good question. I think the answer, the answer is yes. I mean, I, I know that what I've just showed has suggested that um, a lot of the variables we thought might be important at picking up between community variation weren't. Um, but I guess that's really looking at, at, at it from a between community point of view. And something like social capital, we certainly found to be important within communities. So communi if individuals who felt that there was a lot of social capital were actually more likely to be prepared. So that social capital is certainly something that I think you can work on. Um, and that's how tight-knit, how integrated communities are, I think is something that really will probably help um, preparedness. So I think there's definitely room for more research on this. And I think also subjective social norms. If you think of social capital as the carrot, then I think uh, subjective social norms is more the stick. And it's saying, well, if, if, you, can actually, if you can actually make other people um, almost look down on people who don't prepare, um, via this sort of community interaction, um, norms are really quite a powerful way of enforcing preparedness in a way that doesn't require an external agency to do it. I guess it's a, it's a tool of the community itself, and I noticed that Cormac's made a, a comment to that effect. Mick from Northern Territory has sent in a, a bit of a, a tricky question. How relevant is this to remote Indigenous and non-Indigenous people in Arnhem Land and surrounds? Hmm, um, I mean, that, that is a really tricky question for me to answer because I guess all of our, all of our work was done with um, communities in, um, in the southern states. And uh, in particular, when you start talking about indigenous communities, uh, Aboriginal communities, where there are completely different cultural sensitivities, it's, a, it's a, quite a jump for me to say that we can immediately apply what we've done here to the Northern Territory and to indigenous communities. Um, I, think, I think that's a tough one to answer, and I, think some, I don't actually know of any research that specifically touches on that. Um, so I'm probably going to be a bit, bit um, hesitant to say too much there but perhaps an area for future research. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, yes, we, we like to say that in research circles, don't we? 
I'm going to a very different culture. We've actually had a question sent in from Clara from Spain. Um, do you think we could use these findings in the Mediterranean areas where there are non-wooden um, material buildings? And I've paraphrased that there. Um, look, I'm not in a position to really talk so much about the non-wooden buildings. I don't think that's really something that our research touched on. But I, I guess what I'd say, is it, it's fairly similar to with the Indigenous question before, though I guess I'm probably on a little bit safer grounds in saying that I think a lot of the, the variables that we looked at, uh, place attachment, social capital, um, and all the community variables, will probably apply to, to other, other countries, uh, and such as Spain as well. I suspect that the results will be different. I suspect that certain um, certain things might be more or less important in different cultures and different countries. Um, but I but I do think that there's a that this would be applicable there, and, and certainly there's there's room for research in that in that space. So the methodologies and the framework. The methodology, the yeah. I think the especially. Um, I mean, we use questionnaire methodology, which which has you know a lot of failings, as, as many people are, I'm sure, aware. Um, but nonetheless, I think you know large-scale questionnaires um, would be just as applicable there, I think, than here. It would be interesting to compare the, the results. Look, we might leave the questions there. Thank you, Raoul, for your presentation and for answering those questions. Thank you very much. I'll, thanks. I'll now introduce our second research presentation. We're now going to hear from Dr. Alona McNeil from the University of Melbourne. Alona is going to present on information processing under stress and community reactions. Take it away, Alona. Thanks, Tanya. Um, so our project uh, ran from May 2011 until May 2014, and it focused on uh, quite a few different problem statements. So. Uh, summarize those for you here. Um, so first of all, we looked at how can we best define preparedness and more specifically, should it be measured as a unitary construct or be divided into subtypes of preparedness? Uh, second, uh, why do people delay the decision of whether they will defend or evacuate in response to a fire until the day of a fire? So this, in other words, is focused on the wait and fears. Um, thirdly, uh, what are some of the psychological factors, uh, both personality and situational related, that predict preparedness and planning? And finally, how effective are some of the existing uh, communication strategies from the marketing and health domain uh, in, in increasing preparedness? Uh, can we apply those? So to address these questions, uh, our research team conducted three field studies and two workshops at APAC technical group meetings. Um, and to address the first problem statement, um, so we developed and validated a new measure of bushfire preparedness that Raoul mentioned just now. Um, so in that we define preparedness as any cognitive or physical action that a resident can undertake to increase their resilience. So we're really looking at those aspects where people can actually make a difference for themselves. Uh, so obviously there'll be other factors involved in, in resilience as well, but we just focus on these. Uh, and the final measure takes two forms, uh, one comprehensive tool for practitioners, and then we also created a shorter form tool for researchers. And each of these two measures contains three sub-skills, uh, measuring three types of preparedness relating to different bushfire goals that residents may hold, uh, namely one that is preparedness for safely and successfully uh, defending your property against the fire, uh, the second one, uh, preparedness for safely evacuating, and then finally a third type that is preparing to improve your uh, property for survivability in the absence of a defender. Uh, we found it important to separate these preparedness types since someone who isn't even considering defending their property um, is less likely to engage in those types of preparations than someone who is, who is planning to defend. Uh, so by separating people's goals and, and the types of preparedness that come with it, um, we believe that gives us a much more useful picture of, of how prepared people are for their different goals. So to address our second problem statement, um, so we examined what might be causing people to wait and see. Um, and to do that, we asked residents of firefront areas uh, in WA how they respond, how they intend to respond to a bushfire. And 67% uh, uh, indicated that they delayed the decision of whether to defend or evacuate until the day of the fire. So that's quite a large group. And um, in that same study, we measured several factors that might explain why these people are delaying their decision um, until the day of the fire, and found that these wait and fears, they don't differ from the decisive people in their risk perceptions 
or in the extent to which they feel responsible for uh, keeping themselves and their property safe. Uh, we mainly found that they experienced much higher decision difficulties than the others, with the action of defending holding as much value to them as the action of uh, evacuating. So, Similarly, when it comes to factors predicting preparedness, um, not all factors that are plausible predictors will act actually be predictors of, of preparedness and planning. So we set out to uncover which ones did and which ones didn't in our, uh, in our study. Um, so for one, we found that people who perceive the bushfire threat to be more significant, more severe, they tend to prepare better. Uh, however, differences in perceived likelihood of the bushfire threat did not predict differences in preparedness in our study. Uh, that likelihood was, was generally already medium to high. Um, second, we found that um, people who are more indecisive in life in general, they tend to see themselves as less able to prepare and to reduce the threat uh, of bushfires. And as a result, they end up planning less for bushfires than those who are, more, uh, who are less indecisive. And so this highlights that increasing people's perceived ability to prepare and to deal with a bushfire threat might be an important way of increasing preparedness. Uh, related to this, we found that people who are more anxious uh, also tend to plan less. Uh, but it was, this was explained in our study by the fact that the highly anxious people tend to be more indecisive as well. So it was their indecisiveness that was ca causing them to, uh, to not plan for bushfires. And finally, we found that worrying can have a slight positive effect on planning behaviors, uh, but that this really may depend on the type of worry. Uh, which we think has to be constructive in nature. And we're currently conducting some follow-up studies to separate the roles of constructive and unconstructive worry in, uh, in hazard preparedness. Uh, finally, we examined several strategies um, that have been shown to influence behavior in marketing and health domains and tested whether these could be used to influence bushfire preparedness as well. Um, for one, we asked residents to either focus on some of the easiest thing they, things they still had to do uh, or some of the most difficult things they still had to do to prepare for bushfires. And we then asked them for their intentions to complete all of the preparatory actions they still needed to complete for the, for the fire season. Um, and letting people focus on some of the easiest things first led to greater overall intentions to prepare than focusing on the more difficult things first. Um, we also looked at influencing behavior by make, making people think about the progress they'd already made towards being prepared or how committed they were towards being prepared, because that's been shown to have effects in other areas. But that study actually didn't really show any promising results, and results were quite inconsistent with, with what has been found in other areas. So it seems that some methods that have been effective in marketing or health might be better to use in a bushfire preparedness setting uh, than, than other strategies. So in sum, um, we would advise both practitioners and researchers to keep people's goals in mind when uh, they're examining preparedness levels and select the right type of preparedness just to know what people are preparing for. Uh, and secondly, uh, our research has shown that not all factors that are thought or could be thought to influence preparedness and planning are actually influencing them necessarily. Uh, so our research has started to uncover some of the factors uh, we could be focusing on. And finally, we've uh, found that some methods of influencing behavior uh, that have been shown to work in marketing and health domains uh, show more promise in the bushfire preparedness domain than others. And that leads me to um, the final question, what next in our research? So um, I'm currently running a BNH CRC project in which we're uh, testing how to use different, uh, how to use of different information sources. So going to community information sessions versus going online to find your information there relates to different types of uh, preparedness and the levels of preparedness. Uh, we're currently exploring the roles of constructive and unconstructive worry in um, motivating preparedness. Uh, and we'll continue testing um, interventions and nudges to increase hazard preparedness and explore the role of indecisiveness, perceived ability, and motivation to prepare uh, in natural hazard preparedness as well. Um, so that brings me to the end of this presentation. Um, I'd just like to thank my old project team members, Dr. Pat Donald from UWA, uh, Professor David Morrison, who's at Murdoch, and Professor Tim Skinner, who's at Charles Darwin University, for their contributions to the project as well. Thank you, Elena. We've got some questions coming through, starting with um, Brenda has asked, did you look at optimism, especially in relation to those who are anxious and worrying? Um, we didn't 
look at optimism. I'm not sure how, how to understand this question. Um, I guess the people who, who were more in, indecisive, I would say that because their perceptions of being able to deal with, with bushfires were, were actually quite low. So um, in, in this case, um, it was the opposite of optimism. They were quite, quite negative about their own skills, and that was, was leading them to not prepare or not plan in this study. It could optimism perhaps be related to, um, to helping people with perceptions of self-efficacy, for example, and it's um, in the preparation stage than in a crisis. I'm not sure whether it's optimism or whether it's increasing people's uh, ability to cope and people's ability to actually take action and um, yeah, so preparing and planning can be quite a complex activity. And I think that one of the things that we found is that for some people it just seems too much, so why even try? Because um, having a good bushfire plan might be might involve so many different uh, complexities and you know, looking at all the different contingencies that just thinking about it, they'll be like, well, I, I wouldn't be able to do this. I can't handle that. Um, so why even start with those steps? And then looking at that other study, um, in which we showed that letting people focus on some of the things that are easy to do actually led to greater intentions to prepare and then focusing on the difficult things to do. So I think we can maybe increase that, well, I don't know if, if it's optimism or their perceived ability to, to do things and motivate them to start doing things mm -hmm. by focusing on those, um, on those easier things first. Yeah. Um, Gwyn has asked a question which to some degree you've already answered a little bit but you might be able to add to it. Um, she's interested in and your comments on anxious people being less inclined to plan and prepare. Could you expand on this a little bit? Um, so in our study it, it wasn't necessarily the people who were anxious. That wasn't driving the fact that they weren't planning. So uh, one thing that's been found uh, in a lot of different studies in different domains is that anxiety and indecisiveness tend to be highly correlated. So people who are highly anxious in nature tend to be uh, very indecisive as well. Um, and it's this indecisiveness that, that, that was driving in our study, the lack of planning. Um, so you might have some people who are highly anxious um, that aren't indecisive, and they, that wasn't actually predicting that lack of planning in our study. Uh, and I think Lise will actually talk a bit more on the topic of, of anxiety and how that relates to preparedness. Mm. So she might be able to address it in okay. more detail. Um, Zoe has asked, how much of the variance in preparedness were you able to predict? Oh, I'd have to go back to the data for that one. <laughs> um, generally speaking, well, I don't, yeah, it depends on the type of preparedness. Um, I think it ranged, in one of our studies, it was actually quite high. It was in, in the point 20, point, between point 0.20 and point 0.30. That was for the indecisiveness study. Uh, so that was actually, we predicted a lot of the variance in planning for that one. Um, but then looking at studies, and this is going three years back, so I should know this, but I, you know, it, it, it does depend on what type of preparedness you're looking at and what predicting factors you're taking into account and how many you're taking into account. Yeah, um, so it's specific. Yeah. Um, Andrew has asked if you to elaborate on the marketing and health methods that you referred to that were more effective than others. Um, so we started looking into this and we haven't obviously covered all the different techniques that have been used in marketing and health. Um, so for our studies, looking at, um, so, so letting people focus on some of the easier things first. Um, which increases their perceived ability to actually do some things. Um, um, so that was more effective in, in just motivating people to, to think about preparing more and having greater intentions to, to prepare. Uh, then, you know, if you focus on some of the difficult, most difficult things that you're still, that you still need to do that might be, form such a barrier that you might think, oh, why even bother with the rest? Um, but some of the things, that, so Raul was talking about social norms, the role of that, um, we, we didn't look at that in this project, but there are studies going on right now that are looking more at exploring that role of social norms and to what extent can that motivate preparedness and are there barriers in the use of that as a, as a technique as well. 
Um, so I think we made a start, um, but we're definitely, we need to explore some other methods that have been shown to be effective in the marketing and health domain. Yeah. Lyle has asked about one, I guess. Um, do you think a practical step-by-step -step guide would make it easier for anxious people? Um, that might make it easier. The, the, the problem is that um, with the indecisive and anxious people, well, step-by-step -step guide, does that work for making a fire plan? Because every situation, every household is different. And if you look at um, what an ideal fire plan or looks like, it's actually quite a complex system of interactions between, you know, where do people work? Do they have children? Do the children go to multiple schools? Uh, how does that influence their, their plan on a weekday versus a weekend or an evening, et cetera, guest visiting? Um, so I think maybe a step-by-step -step plan could help them, um, but it's still, in a whole, is quite a complex thing to figure out for your household what to do in all these different situations. And the second thing is that the step-by-step -step plan, um, what the, what the more indecisive and anxious people are also worried about is how they'll respond during, like, are they able to respond in the right way during a fire? Uh, so helping them shouldn't just focus on this is how you prepare and plan, but it's probably also important to look at, you know, this is how that you can increase their ability to actually deal with that situation during, during it happening. Um, I think we've got time just for one more question before our next presentation. Ian has asked, what percentage of people did you classify as anxious and nervous in the community? Um, we didn't make groups. We actually looked at the uh, distribution across. So we used anxiety as a, you know, from bottom to top predictor of, um, of, of, of planning in our study. Um, so we used the standard uh, anxiety, trait anxiety measure um, to measure differences in anxiety. So, yeah, we didn't look at highly anxious versus non-anxious individuals. We looked at how, as anxiety goes up, uh, planning might go down, uh, and that's because they tend to become more indecisive as well. Um, Look, I'm, I know I said one more question, but I'm going to sneak another one in because I was thinking this same thing that Mick has asked. Um, how are we able to utilize the preparedness strategy of other major disasters like cyclones to assist in marketing bushfire preparedness. How, how much do this, does the commonality of human nature translate between these different risks and crises? Um, I think that is something that I think that definitely um, um, strategies that will be effective in one domain uh, can definitely be used and tested in, in other domains. Uh, for example, if you look at social norms, um, if they work in a uh, bushfire setting, then there's no reason to think why they wouldn't work in a cyclone setting too. But looking at what people actually need to do and the actions involved might differ. So there might actually be some differences there. So, for example, one of the things with, uh, with social norms is do they, do they work when people perceive their ability to, to carry out the actions to be too low. You know, you can think, well, you know, my neighbors are doing all these things, but I just don't my, see myself as able to do this because my household is different for these reasons, etc. So that might be um, different across different hazards as well. So I think there's, yeah, definitely things we can bring across different hazards and also things that we need to pay attention to the fact that they might differ uh, on some subtle levels here and there as well. Yeah. Okay, we'll leave it there, Alona. Thank you for your um, presentation and for your answers to the questions. I'll now introduce our third research presentation, which is from Dr. Lise Notterbert. She's going to be presenting on managing threat through the modification of thought. Thank you, Lise. Thanks, Tanya. Um, so our research was to do with cognitive processing of threatening or bushfire-related information. Uh, so the residents of a bushfire prone area has can face an, an overwhelming amount of information about potential dangers and how to cope with them. So you've got the fire danger ratings to look out for, you've got the leaflets that, that you might get in the mail, you've got radio uh, warnings, you've got television ads, uh, you have to check your gutters, clean out your gutters, look at other leaflets and uh, clean that up. 
Um, you can feel that it's a really hot day and maybe it's very windy. It's all a lot of information to process. Um, talks at your neighbors as well about your bushfire plan. But then there's also stuff in daily life. So you've got your work to worry about, you've got your family um, to take care of, you've got your finances that you have to do, your health maybe to worry about. And then maybe there's information that you want to process about other things like, you know, you might be wanting to watch YouTube videos to improve your surfing skills. So there's too much information to all take in. So we have to be selective in the types of information that we process. And some of that selectivity can be deliberate, intentional. You choose to focus on this or that. But there's a lot of kind of unconscious information processing and information selectiv processing selectivity that goes on as well. So if we're talking about processing information about threat like bushfire, uh, there's a cost to it. We know that uh, in processing information about threat increases people's anxiety and worry. But there's also a potential benefit in that uh, it can contribute to danger mitigation behavior. Um, such as bushfire preparedness. So in terms of the cost, this, is, this comes from research on experimental psychopathology that investigates the relationship between cognition and emotion. And this research has reliably demonstrated that processing information about threat is associated with higher levels of anxiety and worry. And when, when we look at the relationship between emotion and behavior, which is something that has been done very often in health psychology research, um, the we know that uh, higher levels of anxiety and worry can, in some instances, contribute to um, protecting oneself against danger. Um, so we've got this cost and benefits, and um, our goal is um, to map these all together and see what the relationship between all these variables are. So we've got the emotional experience, your anxiety and your worry, the behavioral preparedness, uh, both in terms of intentions to prepare and actual preparedness that we wanted to look at, and then crucially, we were in, in interested in investigating these cognitive processes that may um, be associated with both, um, map out this process, and then see if we can change the cognitive processes. Can we also change um, the emotional experience and the behavioral preparedness? So basically, the aims of our project were to improve behavioral threat management through an enhanced understanding of individual different factors in cognition and emotion, so map out those relationships. Uh, and establish emotional and cognitive mechanisms that might, may enhance or impede preparedness behavior. So we had two themes in um, our research. One was really mapping out uh, these relationships between the variables, anxiety, worry, cognitive processing, and behavior. And we ran seven studies within this first theme. And I'm going to go into a little bit detail um, about three of the studies. One study was um, done in residents in the bushfire prone area in Western Australia, where we looked at the relationship between anxiety, cognitive bias, and bushfire preparedness. And our main finding in the study was that all are indeed related, and people at higher levels of anxiety and worry uh, also had um, more cognitive biases favoring the processing of threatening information, but it tended to pay more attention to threat-related threat and bushfire-related information. We also had a negative interpretation bias. So if they were confronted with ambiguous information, they were more likely to interpret that in a negative way. Um, these people also showed worse preparedness, though, which was not something we expected. Um, they had higher preparedness intentions, but lower, lower actual preparedness. Then in a second study, we looked at um, the relationship between anxiety and this attentional bias, so favoring attentional processing of threat-related information, and the relationship with danger mitigation. Because in a lot of the experimental psychopathology, psychopathology research that has been done previously, it's just about threats that you can do nothing about. But of course, with bushfires, the whole idea of preparedness is that you have some control uh, over the um, outcomes of being exposed to this danger. So we wanted to look at whether having control over the danger, does that affect cognitive processes, and is that a function of anxiety? And we found that it is. We found amplified processing of threat in high anxious individuals in uh, situations where the dangers um, could be mitigated, so could be controlled, which is a really important finding. In the third study, we looked at the relationship between anxiety potential by in older versus younger adults, because um, of course, if you look at, at bushfire prone areas, um, there's a higher proportion of maybe older adults in those areas. And we didn't know whether the cognitive processes um, that are related to anxiety are the same in older versus younger adults. And then this, this study, we found that they were. So this kind of gave us um, 
grant for generalizing the findings that we have to um, maybe um, more people in the areas that we're interested in, not just the younger ones. So we ran four additional studies um, within this theme, uh, looking at uh, various different uh, cognitive biases that are associated with anxiety, because they haven't all been mapped out. Um, most studies are focused on attention, but we are also interested in risk perception. We showed that anxiety is associated with higher perceptions of risk um, and more engagement and risk mitigation behavior in this study. Um, we found uh, that anxiety is associated with a more negative expectancy bias, so people expect more negative things to happen in the future. Um, we also, there's kind of mixed evidence for um, the existence of a memory bias in anxiety, but we showed in um, study six that anxiety is associated with a prospective memory bias. So not just memory for the past, but memory for certain in events that have important implications for the future, that you maybe have to do something about in the future, uh, which is also more relevant to bushfire, the bushfire context. Um, and then we also looked at um, the relationship between anxiety, attention bias, the threat, and trauma-related intrusions, um, and shown that um, the uh, frequency of intrusions is predicted by an attention bias to threat. So if people tend to allocate attention more to threatening information. They tend to have more intrusions uh, after they, they've been exposed to trauma, and their anxiety predicts the negativity of those intrusions. So this was also uh, an important study to map out all those relationships. Then in the second theme of our research, we looked at whether if we change the cognitive processes in the middle of this, this framework, can we actually change uh, emotion and behavior? So in the first study, we um, used a paradigm called attentional bias modification in residents in the bushfire-prone community. So attentional bias modification, this it's a computerized task that kind of encourages people either to pay more attention or to pay less attention to certain types of information. And in this study, we had people either, we trained them to pay more attention to threat or pay less attention to threat. And we looked at the effect on um, emotion and preparedness behavior. And we found, which is promising, that this attentional bias can be modified. So we were able to induce different patterns of attentional bias in our two groups. But this had no direct impact on preparedness behavior. So although we could change the cognitive process, we weren't able to change um, behavior uh, resulting from it. And in the second study, um, we looked at cha changing interpretive bias. Uh, so this, this tendency to impose negative resolutions on ambiguous materials. So either we trained one group to impose more negative resolutions and one group to impose more positive resolutions. And uh, wanted to see also if that drives adaptive behavior. And again, we found that interpretation bias can be modified, so we can change the cognitive process, but this did not have a direct impact on protection behavior. We could modify worry, um, and worry was related to protection behavior, but there was no direct impact of the uh, interpreta interpretation bias training uh, on protection behavior. So in this kind of theme of research, we also um, tried to optimize our methods for modifying the cognitive processes. Um, so we developed new tasks in study uh, 2.3 um, that would be um, could potentially uh, produce more robust changes in uh, attentional bias. We played around with the um, kind of the, um, the features of the task a little bit in study 2.4 and looked at um, if you give explicit instructions, we get better or worse training. Uh, we also looked at um, targeted training. So if you've got, if you know that there's a situation where attentional bias is going to be maladaptive, can we change attentional bias just for that situation? And we looked at sleep-related worry, worry problems. And we've also shown that you, with an um, iPhone app, that we could do that. So we've kind of, in this second theme, we also tried to establish better ways to changing um, cognitive biases, such that if we know what the optimal pattern of cognition is, we are then uh, optimally able to uh, induce that pattern of cognition. So in terms of the conclusions um, of our research, we found that uh, increased worry and anxiety is associated with increased cognitive processing of threats especially when the danger is controllable. 
uh, which was a really important finding because, um, to the best of my my knowledge, no one's looked at um, uh, cognitive processes in response to controllable or uncontrollable danger. Um, however, this had no bearing on, ad on adaptive behavior, which is also something that came out of um, Ely's uh, research, for example. So we were thinking, we've, we had this kind of one-on-one -on -one, um, mapping of cognition, emotion, and behavior in our framework, but, but maybe that's too simplistic, and this is also something that Ely has highlighted. Maybe it's specific patterns of uh, anxiety and worry um, that need to be present, and other patterns uh, need to be absent. So you only you can only worry about bushfire-related stuff, but not about everything. Maybe that's um, the optimal pattern to get people um, to be really well prepared. Maybe it's a specific pattern of interaction between your emotions, your cognitive processes, that will lead to adaptive behavior, uh, not just a one-on-one -on -one mapping. Maybe there's other mediating variables. This has been touched on as well, like self-efficacy. Um, that will play an important role in this, this whole um, area as well. Um, but then I think um, the take-home message from our um, second theme of research is that if we can find the optimal cognitive processing template, for optimal bushfire preparedness, then um, you can use the cognitive bias modification techniques that we've established and that we've kind of uh, improved upon uh, to induce these patterns of cognition. And um, there's lots of ways you, we can still play around with these cognitive bias modification techniques even more. But I think we've established them pretty well, and the focus should be on uh, mapping out these relationships between emotion, cognition, and behavior uh, for future research. That's it. Thank you, Elise. We've had a comment from Kathy that, um, that I think sort of raises a couple of questions, or one question. She said that in terms of encouraging people to prepare and feel they can prepare, the New South Wales Rural Fire Service app on bushfire preparation plans has been well received by people that Kathy's been speaking with. Do you think that there's um, potentially some benefit in thought modification from the connection that comes through social media? Yeah, I, I definitely think that there is that potential, uh, especially now that we've um, developed our tasks um, to be implemented on smartphones. Um, um, so we, we, we ran a study, the sleep, sleep study that we ran uh, was on attention advice modification uh, on a smartphone. And I think um, we had thought about this as well. If you have an app that kind of that people can log into and they can monitor their bushfire preparedness and they can monitor the warnings in their areas. Um, when we find um, the optimal cognitive pattern that is associated with best preparedness, we can maybe add to those existing apps and have we, we present them as games, little games where people uh, play an attentional game and we induce that optimal pattern of a. Uh, of attentional bias, for example. So I think um, given that these tasks are fairly simple and that we've now uh, tried to have more game-like tasks as well to induce these patterns of cognition, I think they're well suited to incorporate in social media with, um, in, uh, in addition to uh, existing apps, for example. Mm, excellent. Thanks, Liz. We'll leave it there um, for now. Uh, now we've heard from all of our researchers we're going to have another poll question, and in this case you can give more than one answer. In what ways could you begin to use what you've heard today? So we're not asking you to make a formal commitment, we're just asking you to give us a sense of how will you use the research that you've heard presented today, and you can click more than one option. So will you share and discuss it with colleagues and stakeholders, use the findings to inform policy and practice in your organisation, advocate for more resources for community safety, and or learn more about how you can apply this work in your role. And we'll give it a few more seconds. And we'll leave it there. And it's good to see a combination of people using this both internally within their organisations and externally as well. We're now going to hear from today's lead end user. Um, Damien Killerly is from the Tasmanian Fire Service. Damien, can you just start off quickly by giving us your response to the research that we've heard today and how relevant it is in your role? 
It's uh, very relevant and it's certainly shifted the way that uh, agencies seek to influence bushfire prone communities across the country. Uh, this particular suite of uh, research projects adds significantly to our understanding about uh, preparations people should make uh, for uh, the bushfire season, the preparations they may or may not make in case fire threatens and how they're likely to respond when fire actually threatens. It offers us a variety of ways in which fire agencies may uh, influence uh, people's preparedness behaviour and their responses when bushfires threaten, uh, particularly through uh, our pre-season advice but also during our, during, uh, through our emergency warnings. It also highlights how that there's much that we still don't know and uh, uh, many of the researchers we've heard from this morning have uh, highlighted the need uh, for further research and I certainly support that. In terms of um, uh, the community level influences project, I guess the, the most significant take out is that it reinforces for us uh, the need to continue to um, uh, encourage people to understand the bushfire risk uh, and also to participate in some sort of uh, bushfire ready neighbourhood um, community group because that uh, seems to have a significant uh, impact on, on uh, preparedness levels uh, at the household level. In terms of uh, ILI's uh, project, the information processing under stress, um, the, the, the having a, a means of measuring uh, household preparedness uh, for bushfire is a, is a terrific tool and something that the agencies can apply across the country. Uh, it, it enables us to measure the effectiveness of our programs in, in getting people to uh, prepare, uh, but it's also a tool that, uh, that uh, householders themselves can use, uh, which uh, we're going to find uh, very useful to market to householders. I think uh, the most interesting thing that coming out of, uh, that's coming out of that project, though, is the valuable insight uh, it gives us into what's causing people to delay their decision to leave, and this notion that... Um, uh, that people uh, value equally, at least those who wait and see, value equally the uh, uh, staying to defend their property uh, and uh, leaving for a place of safety. And it's not until the, the balance tips in one direction or another uh, that they make a decision to leave. And I guess my major concern there that the agencies need to address is that uh, at the point at which it tips uh, in favour of leaving is also um, when it becomes uh, unsafe to leave and therefore people's options are very, very limited. In terms of the uh, project uh, that Lee spoke on uh, just now, um, it, it, we're now getting some insights for the first time, I believe, in uh, the role that anxiety plays in, in people's uh, decision making and their response to bushfires. And interestingly, the fact too that some people are not uh, anxious enough to pay attention to the material we provide and to act on it, while others are too anxious. And um, if, if a tool can be developed that's going to enable people to manage their anxiety, either to increase it or decrease it, then that's going to be a significant step forward uh, for the agencies, for the sector, for a group of people that we haven't paid any attention to until now. We've had a question sent in from Loriana. She's asked, what are the critical communication principles that emergency management agencies should adopt? Well, I think the most important one, and, and one we've be, become aware of only in, in relatively recent times, that is that uh, uh, messages to members in the community need to be tailored to their specific needs. And we've learnt from um, uh, the project Rail spoke about in particular that um, uh, the needs of communities are different, the needs of individuals are different based on things like their, uh, their retirement status, their age, their uh, experience with fire, uh, their membership of a community uh, group and so on. Uh, uh, the challenge for the fire agencies will be to uh, get that tailored information to the individuals that need it and uh, relying on mass media to do that presents major problems obviously relying on more targeted um, uh, means like uh, mobile phones, while they're available, we don't yet have the means to tailor specific messages to uh, individuals based on their, their own circumstances. Actually, you foreshadowed my next question, which was going to be about thinking internally. Um, are there any changes that need to occur within fire and emergency management um, in that sector to take up the findings into policy and practice, you know, aside from the changing role of traditional media and social media? Well, look, there, there are lots of things we need to do to um, include the research findings in policy and practice. Uh, we recently had a, a national workshop to look at the 10 years of social research uh, up until about uh, six or seven months ago that uh, the sector needs to act on. 
this uh, I've just lost my screen now. It's back again. This uh, this um, uh, new body of work uh, that uh, UWA uh, has delivered uh, needs to be added to that, and we need to consider the findings. But but we're already considering how we're going to integrate it with the national warnings and advice uh, project that's currently being undertaken, the um, national. Uh, fight age rating system project that uh, has recently uh, kicked off and uh, certainly when we're looking at uh, community impact we're going to need to take into account uh, this body of research and also uh, a national uh, community re emergency response model project project that's being led out of Emergency Management Victoria that uh, New South Wales, Western Australia and Tasmania are currently engaged in. It's going to inform all of those, um, uh, those current initiatives across the country. Well, thanks for your insights, Damien. That's all we've got time for for now. We're now going to have um, a final um, poll for people to participate in. We're just going to revisit our first poll and see what you feel your level of knowledge is. So how much do you think you know about community preparedness and response for bushfire? seconds more. <coughs> and we'll leave it there. And I, I think I can safely claim that we've shifted in the direction and just a little bit of people knowing more about community preparedness. Um, so that brings to a close today's, um, today's forum. We're now going to have all of the presenters back on screen just to share their final take-home message that they'd like to leave you with. Starting with Raoul, what's your final thoughts and take-home message? Well, Raoul, you're on mute. Uh, my apologies. Um, is that better? Um, my final thought is really that there are differences between communities. Um, they perhaps weren't quite as large as what we had expected to see, um, but really they, um, they, we can certainly identify a lot of factors that make individuals well or poorly prepared. And it seems that communities um, differ as a, as, a, as a function of the aggregate of, of what types of individuals like that that they have. And that really gives us something that we can work on in, in terms of um, uh, variables to look at. Uh, and I've named a few in the past, such as the social norms um, and some um, yeah, behavioural con perceived control of uh, undertaking actions. So things like that we can work on. Excellent. Thanks, Raoul. And Illy? Um, I think one of the take home, key take home messages from, from our project is that um, risk perceptions are definitely of influence uh, when it comes to preparedness and planning, but they're not, not the only thing we should be focusing on. I think it's very important to focus on people's perceptions of being able to deal with, uh, to, to uh, be prepared and deal with uh, responding to fires, um, and also that decision difficulties, um, things like that can form um, major obstacles in, in why people aren't preparing and planning. So we should be focusing on more than just their risk perception. Thank you. And Liz? Um, I think um, the take-home message from our research links in that Raoul's finding that 95% of variance in preparedness is explained by individual factors. And we take that to a level where um, we want to investigate the cognitive processes um, through cognitive tasks. Uh, and we've shown that they are linked to um, individual preparedness and to uh, emotional factors that also contribute to preparedness. So I think this is a really important area to investigate further. It's a little bit more tricky because you have to use these cognitive tasks to tap into the cognitive processes, but I think they will be able to uh, reveal a lot uh, uh, about uh, the variance in individual preparedness. True. And Damien, the lead end user, always gets final say. Uh, the Bushfire South Sea Social Research Program has added uh, significantly to uh, our body of knowledge about uh, how to uh, manage community responses to bushfire. Um, it's significantly changed the way the, the sector uh, seeks to manage uh, community response to bushfire, but there's a long, long way to go yet. Uh, there's a need to get a very good uh, detailed understanding of the research findings, to work at how we're going to apply them in policy and practice, but to recognise too that, that uh, despite all of that new knowledge and despite uh, the way we might use that, uh, uh, that knowledge, 
uh, it's not a silver bullet. There are lots of other things we need to do. So we need to integrate it with appropriate Australian standards for building in bushfire prone areas, for appropriate land use planning, for appropriate planning at the community level to identify where vulnerable people are going to be, um, what assets they want us to protect. Um, um, improved prediction tools for bushfire, improved uh, bushfire impact uh, uh, tools, and these are being developed uh, slowly, uh, but there's a great deal more work to be done. Uh, it's fantastic to ha add this work to, to what we know and understand. Thank you, Damien. Well, that brings today's forum to a close. So thank you to the presenters, Raul, Leas, Ilona and Damien for their insights, and of course to you, the audience, for your participation. We encourage you to visit the website at www.bushfirecrc.com where in the coming days we will make today's presentations and video available and related reports and fire notes can also be found on the website. There's also a brief exit survey so if you have time we'd really appreciate it if you could take the time to stay online and provide feedback. And that was our final forum, but the legacy of the Bushfire CRC is the website where research reports, fire notes, presentations and other resources will continue to be available. On behalf of the Bushfire CRC Research to Drive Change Project and its partners, we thank all of the researchers and lead end users who presented throughout this forum series and to the many people who've watched online and participated. We wish you all the best in your ongoing work and we encourage you to do something with your new knowledge. Good luck in the coming fire season and we'll see you soon.